This is the 25th section on our commentary on the Eucharist from St. Thomas Aquinas. We finish up today talking about the use of the Blessed Sacrament. The first question that Aquinas poses to us is whether it's lawful to receive this sacrament daily. It's actually a pretty common practice to receive the Blessed Sacrament every day, but it also has been, and in some places is, a common practice to, to go to Mass in a state of grace and to not receive uh, the Blessed Sacrament. So, let's see what Aquinas has to say about this. There are two things to be considered regarding the use of the sacrament. First, on the part of the sacrament itself, the virtue of which gives health to men, and consequently it is profitable to receive it daily so as to receive its fruits daily. That's straightforward, right? The Eucharist gives strength of heart to us. It gives us strength, it unites us to Jesus, gives us the courage to persevere in the life of faith. That's something we should receive every day, right? That's something that makes sense to receive every day. The second thing that might be considered is on the part of the recipient who is required to approach this sacrament with great reverence and devotion. Consequently, if anyone finds that he has these dispositions every day, he will do well to receive it daily. Yeah, on the part of the sacrament, this is something that we should receive every day. But then we can ask, well, what about on what about from my side? Am I ready? Have I prepared myself to receive our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament? Or have I just sort of rushed into this thing because it seems like, do, am I treating, way of, maybe one way of thinking about it is like, am I treating the Blessed Sacrament kind of like, like, a, like a magic pill? Or is my heart in it? Like, am I really present in this, in a deep spirit of love and reverence for Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament? This is something, this is an, an interesting kind of um, expanding on this point. Aquinas continues, Reverence for this sacrament consists in fear associated with love. Consequently, a reverential feel of fear of God is called filial fear. Because the desire of receiving arises from love, while the humility of reverence springs from fear, consequently, each of these belongs to the reverence due to this sacrament, both as to receiving it daily and as to refraining from it sometimes. And then he quotes St. Augustine, which is really a really, I think, beautiful quotation. Hence, St. Augustine says, If one says that the Eucharist should not be received daily, while another maintains the contrary, let each one do as according to his devotion thinks right. For Zacchaeus and the centurion did not contradict one another, while one received the Lord with joy, whereas the other said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Since both honored our Savior, though not in the same way. Both love and hope, whereunto the scriptures constantly urge us, are preferable to fear. Hence, too, when Peter said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, our Lord Jesus answered, Do not be afraid. So do you see the kind of dance that Aquinas is making there? Like he's saying, look, Zacchaeus, um, when Jesus said, come down, Zacchaeus, from your tree for tonight, I must stay into your, I must stay in your house. He jumped down and converted and welcomed our Lord into his house. And when the centurion came to Jesus, he said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come onto my roof. Right? And, and Jesus praised that man and he praised his faith. So the idea is like, um, there's a venerable tradition in, in the church on occasion that somebody um, would not receive Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament, and that's not necessarily a sign that that person is in mortal sin or something. It's just a sign that out of reverence um, uh, and out of, in some ways, out of fear of God, the person is saying, Lord, um, I just, uh, I, want to, I want to make sure that I'm, that I'm approaching you with love and devotion in my heart. And so today, on this Tuesday, I'm not going to receive communion. Okay. But again, St. Saint, Saint Thomas Aquinas in the church has never said, you have to do that. He's just saying, this is a devotion, and there's some basis for it in Scripture based on how different people have responded to Jesus and the invitation that he's given to them. You know, Peter saying, depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Um, but then Aquinas does give the, the preference, right, of saying, hey, but by the way, um, love and hope are superior Love and hope are superior to fear, and love drive out, drives out fear. So, 
you know, be drawn into the mystery of Christ and don't be afraid of your own littleness and don't be afraid um, of your own insignificance in the face of the Godhead uh, because Jesus has given this gift to you for your own salvation. So, yeah, that's something to, um, you know, to pray about. Contrast that today with today's like disposition that almost sometimes you can you feel like people receive Jesus in the Eucharist in like a mechanical way. And it's like, yeah, I think it, we should, you know, if we're in a state of grace, we should err on the side of receiving Jesus in the Eucharist. But there's something really um, noteworthy in this kind of practice of the church of someone saying, I know that I believe I'm in a state of grace. I have no reason to think otherwise. But I was distracted or um, I want to make sure that when I go to Jesus, I'm doing it with a heart that's focused on him and a heart that loves him. And I'm not just doing it mechanically. So I'm going to step back just for a minute, you know, just for today, not for the next month, you know, just today and tomorrow when I come to Mass. Uh, that spiritual hunger, that spiritual longing might be even greater. It's just, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting, right? It might be worth thinking about. Maybe not so as to follow that practice, but it's just as to say like, oh, wow, this is a huge thing. And that demands some energy for myself as I approach Jesus in the Eucharist. All right. Then he says, is it lawful to abstain from communion altogether? Okay. Again, he draws the, the distinction. You can receive Holy Communion spiritually and, uh, and therefore receive the effects of Holy Communion. And he says, you can never, you can't abstain from that because that's um, union with Christ. But he says it's possible to abstain from it sacramentally uh, and that be lawful for example if someone doesn't have recourse to the sacraments like they're in a they're in a they're in a country where there are no priests um, they're not penalized for not receiving the blessed sacrament but he says now a desire would be vain except it were fulfilled when opportunity presented itself consequently it is evident that a man is bound to receive this sacrament not only by virtue of the lord's precepts but also by virtue of the lord's commands do this in memory of me okay the idea being if you have a desire to receive holy communion and then the opportunity presents itself and you're you're capable of receiving holy communion well then like you should do that last and interestingly whether it's lawful to receive the body of christ without the blood of christ Okay, again, this has been a kind of a, a common question today because it's been the practice since after the Second Vatican Council of receiving Jesus under both species, under the species of bread and the species of wine, which hasn't, as you may know, been the tradition earlier on in the church. Um, so for a long time, at least, the, the faithful received Jesus just under the species of bread and not under the species of bread and wine. That got changed after the Second Vatican Council. And, but then, of course, with COVID, for a while, at least in most parishes, um, people have just received the body of Christ, not the blood of Christ. Okay, so what's the deal? Like, is it, are we getting shortchanged, you know, if we just receive the body of Jesus and not the blood of Jesus? How does this work? Okay, Aquinas says two points should be observed. The part uh, regarding the sacrament. The first is on the, on the part of the sacrament, and then the other is on the part of the recipient. Okay, on the part of the sacrament, the priest who offers the sacrifice to God the Father, he must, not just should, he must receive both the body and the blood of Jesus for the sacrament to be perfected. The reason for that is because, well, this is what Jesus did. And so Jesus um, explicitly like, commands us to follow his, his example. And arguably the reason that Jesus did this is because the separation of his body and his blood is a signification of his death on the cross, the separation of his blood from his body on the cross, that his blood poured out for our salvation. And so that's realized by the dual consecration and the, and the dual reception of um, Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. And that's basically what he says. On the part of the sacrament, it is proper for both the body and the blood to be received, since the perfection of the sacrament lies in both. And consequently, since it's the priest's duty to consecrate and finish the sacrament, right, he ought on no account to receive Christ's body without the blood. Okay, then he asks, well, what about for the faithful? And there's a, there's a kind of nuanced answer. So the reception of Jesus' body and blood by the faithful is not necessary to receive the fullness of the effects of the sacrament of Jesus, or the fullness of the effects of this holy sacrament, namely a perfect union with Jesus and a perfect communion with the with the saints, with the Church of God. 
that's not just receiving Holy Communion or just receiving the precious blood. That fulfills the reality of the, the fruitfulness of the sacrament of Jesus on the cross, of, this, of the sacrament of, of the Eucharist, right? Um, there's the, a person isn't getting shortchanged in terms of the grace that they receive by just receiving the Eucharist or just receiving the blood of Jesus. That's dogma. <laughs> like that's that's really important, right? That's that's not uh, that's a that's a definitive teaching of the church. Okay. Nonetheless, the fullness of the sign is contained under receiving both the body and the blood of Jesus. Um, arguably for that reason, the Second Vatican Council, or the reforms that followed from the Council, reinstituted the common reception of the chalice, or at least having the chalice being offered um, during, during Mass. Okay, because it's the fullness of the sign of what the Eucharist represents, which is um, Jesus' passion. Okay, so that's an argument to receive from the chalice. One then, I think, only reasonably sh should mention, like, well, why was there this tradition for a thousand years that the faithful didn't receive from the chalice? And these are the reasons that Aquinas gives for that. But on the part of the recipient, the greatest reverence and caution are called for, lest anything happen which is unworthy of so great a mystery. Now, this could especially happen in receiving the blood, for if incautiously handled, it might easily be spilt. And because the multitude of the Christian people increased, in which there are old, young, and children, some of whom have not enough discretion to observe due caution in using this sacrament, on that account it is a prudent custom in some churches for the blood not to be offered to the reception of the people, but to be received by the priest alone. So this is basically a prudential argument that says it's impossible to show too much reverence to Jesus, to love Jesus too much in the Blessed Sacrament. And it's really easy for the chalice to be spilled. And that's, of course, like a grave thing. That's a serious thing when the blood of Jesus is spilled or when the host, when the body of Christ is dropped. Um, like it's not a little thing. It's a it's a it's heartbreaking. And so there's this long tradition of the church that says, hey, if we start handing out the chalice, that's going to be challenging for some people that 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 increases the likelihood of the chal of of the chalice being spilt. And for that reason, it wasn't the common practice for a long time to receive the chalice. So anyways, this is a kind of like, you know, a kind of something about which people can have reasonable discussions. I suppose you could put it like that. And there have been different kind of moments of tradition in the church um, that have pra that have favored one practice over another practice. This is a sort of this is a sort of thing that's like, hey, we can have a real discussion about this and come to some kind of reasonable uh, conclusion and reasonable practice. And I think that's like really beautiful and, and healthy and helpful. Hope this was a cool section for you. Next time we're going to start something new, which is the use which Christ made of the sacrament. See ya.